for me, values are really, really important. I had to live by what was true to me. I figured that if I could run my own business, I could actually run it the way that I felt it should be run, which is values-based, getting the right people, making sure people are doing the right things, holding them accountable. We're mostly control freaks, let's be honest. I mean, if there's people listening in, we, we are, we're control freaks. And so we like to have things done our way because we know as entrepreneurs, you know, I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur myself. We're distracted by bright, shiny lights and we want to do this over here. We've got these crazy ideas. And so we can actually do damage to our own business because of that. Let's make sure that we are really clear around what the roles and functions are in the business, who's accountable for those roles and functions. And so it's like getting clear on what's important to you and then designing your business around your life. Welcome to another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. I'm your host, Nikki Ballou. Boy, do we have an exciting guest lined up for you today. Today's guest is one of the world's leading implementers of this spectacular methodology that helps entrepreneurs scale. It is called the EOS methodology, and you're going to learn all about it. I am speaking, of course, of none other than the one, the only, the legendary Deborah Chantry Taylor. Welcome to the show, Deborah. Good morning. Thank you very much. Very excited to be here. Uh, so, is, is it morning for you over there? It's not, is it? It's, it's, it's afternoon, not, it's isn't it? It's afternoon, but it's all good. It's hey, morning for me. Yeah. The world. Actually, you're all the way around the world. You're kind of like Just on about. the other side. Yeah. Up, up side. Yeah. Yeah. yeah for Excellent. us. But this is this is the magic of, of technology. We're able to have a beautiful conversation, even though we're we're not anywhere near one another. But it sounds like we're right next to each other, which is great. So, Deborah, <laughs> the person who listens to the show is an entrepreneur. They're one of yep. our peeps. They're the kind of people you and I really <laughs> love a lot and, 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 and admire. And they listen to the show, not because they want to hear from me, because they hear from me every week. They want to hear from you. They want to know mm-hmm. how you have created success in your world. And they also want to know how they can learn from you and use what they learn from you to be more successful in their own world. But the yep. only way they're going to open up to you is if they get to know you. they got to feel your heart. So tell us your backstory. How'd you get to be the great Deborah Chantry Taylor? <laughs> um yeah well, it's, an, it's an interesting backstory so i um i have actually always unbeknownst to myself been an entrepreneur i was at school at 13 years old i was running many businesses to help supplement my income ensure that i had money to to do the things i wanted to do and then i had quite a traditional family and so um as i was going through my schooling my father said to me you know even though i loved people and i loved um, languages and i loved all these things about people he said oh you really should do science and it's like why would i do science well because you're good at it and it will help you find a good husband you know a, a good Good wife should be well educated and if you get a science degree it will help you find a good husband and so you know back in those days that's what what, what we did and so I went oh, okay don't really like science that much but I'll give it a go and so I'm actually a trained biochemist and food technologist by trade yep um, and I suddenly when I finished my my studies and went into working in science I realized I hated it because looking into test tubes and things is not really my scene I'm, I'm really a people person and thank goodness I was working with a boss who I actually got offered another role managing another laboratory um, in a scientific environment and I went to my boss at the time and said look I'm I'm going to be leaving I've been offered this job to manage a, a competitive laboratory he went why are you doing that and I went well pretty simple they've offered me a job it's more money and he said Deborah do you like working in a laboratory and I went no he said so why would you go and do that for somebody else and I said uh, more money you know I'm 20 something years old more money don't you understand that he's like I don't think you really enjoy what you do I said no I don't he said I think you like people I said yes I do he said well, I think you should do something with people. And so um, he, I said, but I don't know what that is. And he said, well, we've got a role for a sales kind of liaison person working with our doctors. You'll go out and visit doctors day in, day out. You'll have a chat to them. You'll help solve their problems. You'll make sure they understand what we do. And I went, that sounds cool. How do I do that? Um, and he said, we have never employed somebody your age before. We generally employ much older people, but I'm prepared to give you a shot. I'll go to the board and get approval if you're happy to do it. I went, yeah, okay, let's do it. And and that just changed my life. From there on in, I went into sales and marketing. Um, I got into sort of, you know, general, I went, worked my way up the ladder, got into general management, CEO roles in some reasonably large organizations, just, just doing the stuff that I love, which is actually people. And that's what I realized was it's got absolutely nothing to do with anything other than and I love people. I love motivating, inspiring people. I enjoy working with people to get the best from them. And I did that in my corporate life, if you like, in terms of actually managing and leading people. 
And then after a while doing that for other people, I kind of went, I wouldn't mind doing this for myself. And so I went out and started my own businesses. And I've had a couple of very successful businesses in the technology space, in web development and mobile marketing. And I've had all the toys and the cars and the, the, the motorbikes and all the fun stuff that you get when you're, when you're living uh, the high life. And then I had a spectacular train wreck crash and kind of lost it all overnight and realized that, wow, okay, that it's um, – some really dumb decisions on my part, but but I've learned from those and, and take those forward into my life. And since then, I've 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 been starting businesses and uh, you know just just running businesses and got into helping other people with their businesses as well. So that's kind of the the potted history, if you like, of where I got to. Wow, that's a mm. heck of a backstory. So let's un mm. unpack that a little bit. So <laughs> you were always entrepreneurial, but you didn't know it. You started working yes. for a big corporation. You know, and you went down a career path. Your dad suggested to you. I know I did that too. It wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't something <laughs> I should have done for a while. You know, dad. Dad's great. They love you and all that stuff. But they're not you. They're not living your life. Yep. You know. So, um, and then you you had somebody really take an interest in you, and they kind of like took the time to notice that you were good at what you did, but you didn't really enjoy doing it. And they, they, they really literally changed the trajectory of your life. So I think the mm -hmm. number one lesson I get from that, you need to have people who care as your mentors. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's actually really sad. I, I don't remember. I remember Jeff. I know his first name. I cannot remember his surname and I can't seem to find any records. Of so I've been trying to get in contact with him. So if there's a, if there's a guy out there called Jeff who, who recognizes that story, please get in contact. I'd love to hear from you. But that, I mean, seriously, Jeff actually changed my life. And it was the fact that, yes, he, he was a great leader. He took interest in the people he was working with and he wanted people to actually love what they were doing. And he could see that I didn't. And I think that that it's important to surround yourself with people who will challenge you on that and go, hey, you know, is this really what you want to do? And what else is possible? I think that's the biggest question because often we can't see that when we're brought up in a very rigid structure and told this is what we should do. We don't ask the questions of, well, what else is possible? Um, and, I, and I guess, you know, entrepreneurs generally have that built in intrinsically, but, but, but sometimes it gets beaten out of us too because I think intrinsically I was an entrepreneur. I did, I, I've been in business since 13 and I always, I put my university i put myself through college um but still it was beaten out of me and to know this is what you should be doing and i am very grateful for jeff for changing that trajectory of my life you know what jeff uh, sounds like he was a great man you know mm. he he cared i mean um the great american poetess maya angelou says people will forget what you do people will forget what you say to them but people will never forget how you made them feel and he made you feel like you were somebody, like you mattered, like you being happy was important to him. And I got to say, like, I'm blown away by this guy, Jeff. I mean, he, he's my kind of leader. You know, I'd like to get to meet the guy. I'd like to shake <laughs> his hand and go, wow, man, it's an honor to meet someone like you who, who cared enough to help change the trajectory of the life of somebody that I've come to know and like and respect. So, you know, good on Jeff, but that's important. And that, that, so how did that affect you in terms of how you were with people that you led and people that you've coached and helped in your career? Yeah, well, I think that, I mean, part of my whole thing is uh, I've, I've recognized um, through a number of different events that life is too short and you need to be doing what you love with people that you love. And so as a leader, I think that it's really important that you take interest in the people that you have there. They're not just there to 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 serve you, to do what their job is. They are people, they're humans. And it's like the more that you can take the time to get to know them, to understand them um, and find out what really makes their heart sing, then you can put them into roles that really takes advantage of that so they're happy they're doing what they love with people they love and you're getting the best possible value from them as well because as uh, and we, we teach this in eos with that with our clients it's like actually we've got to look at what you're doing day in day out and make sure you're only doing the stuff that really is the stuff that you love and are great at the other stuff you should delegate out because i i use accounting as an example can i do accounting yeah i'm super smart i can do anything um but am i good at it yeah i'm okay at it do i love it no i absolutely hate it and so if <laughs> If I'm always doing that kind of animal. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a very detail um, focused person either. So I can make a lot of mistakes and that kind of stuff. So I kind of go, well, why would I do that part of my business when I really don't like it? When there's somebody who actually loves accounting, you know, there are some strange people in the world who just get really turned on by doing accounting. So great. Let's have them doing what they love. Um, and therefore they will be in a great 
mental, emotional, physical state. And, and so will I, because I've managed to hand off what I don't want to do. And often as entrepreneurs, we struggle to let go of those things. But when you do and you give it to somebody else and you've got people doing what they love and you're doing what you love, it just changes the way the whole business is run. And even when I was managing a 220 staff in a bus company, it was very much about looking at the people and going, hey, is this really genuinely the role that you want to be in? What else could you be doing in our organization? And you know, we had some staff changes in that organization where people literally switch because they finally discovered what was really important for them. I love it. I think that's that's absolutely fantastic. And you know it, it aligns with with my values and the values of our of, of our organization is lead from love, lead lead from the heart, care about the yep. person in front of you. Business isn't a numbers game, business is a people game. I just love it. I yes. think that's that's spectacular. So yeah. Deborah, the, the next thing I want to unpack here is like mm-hmm. you were successful in corporate life. Like you became a managing director or CEO, which was the same thing, just different ways of saying the same thing. You climbed to yeah. the top of the ladder. What made you decide to give all that up and, you know, be one of these crazy entrepreneur types? <laughs> so again, I, it, it wasn't by design. I'd love to say that my life was designed and I just got to have everything I wanted, but it didn't. It, it got to the point where when I was running the bus company, we had about 220 staff. We actually had a people issue and it was quite a serious people issue. And we had been um, trying to remove a particular person who was, you know, we talk about right people, right seats. This person was not the right person, didn't really share our core values, was really disruptive to the organization. Um, and so while he was very, very good at doing his job, he was really creating havoc in the organization and so we recognized we had to, to move him on you know you can't have those people in your organization and we'd gone through the process of you know talking to him seeing if there's any way that he could improve because I always believe people should be given a chance to improve but he just he, he did not share the core values and we got right to the end of you know getting the, the, this person to realize they should move on to somewhere else and suddenly the the CEO I was actually the GM at the time so the CEO and the board actually pulled the support for that and said no we, we need to keep him and I do, to this day I I don't know exactly what he had on them. I suspect there must be something going on in the background there. But they decided they just couldn't do it. He'd been there for a long, long time. They did not want to let him go. Um, and I realized I actually couldn't stay there because for me, values are really, really important. Uh, you have got to, you know, if you allow that, you're basically saying to everybody else in the organization, this is okay. And, and I can't do that. So I was like, right, I actually can't. If that's going to be your, your decision, then you're going to lose me because I can't stay managing this business while, when that person is, you know, allowed to get away with what he's getting away with. And so I decided to kind of leave that and um <laughs> that was a very good job i was earning good money it was it was very difficult to make that decision but i had to live by what was true to me and so suddenly i found myself you know sort of unemployed and what do i do and so i got invited to um go and manage another business and i suddenly had to realize that actually I think I'm good at running business and, and I'm really good at doing it for other people. But what, what if I could do it for myself? And so I was working with a business again as their CEO in a, in a very um, high tech kind of environment. And I thought I'd like to actually go and try and do something like this for myself. And that was kind of the, the bit of a wake up call was if, if I did my, I guess it was a little bit selfish. I figured that if I could run my own business, I could actually run it the way that I felt it should be run, which is values based, getting the right people, making sure people are doing the right things, holding them accountable etc all those things that are uh, a good business has i love it i love it you know i uh, myself was in a, a corporate world and yes. um, i had this uh, idea that i, I, I want to be in business for myself and i thought about it for years and years and years and i didn't do anything about it finally god decided he was done with me dithering so he had the company i was with go bankrupt you know? <laughs> and, and it was it, he also did me another favor and he made sure it was during the recession so i couldn't easily get another job right i had to start my own business now at the time i obviously didn't see it that way i was kind of ticked off at god but you know god has this way of making me see things the right way after a while and so I started working for myself. I, I became a, a fitness coach mm-hmm. uh, and I had a whole bunch of clients that knew me from when I was a corporate dude and knew I was a pretty fit dude. And they said, okay, well, you know what? I'll, I'll, I'll help you out. I'll, I'll become your, your client. And, and that was, that was the start for me. I made a whole lot less money as my own boss than I did in corporate life for almost a decade. 
But yeah. after a decade, I kind of started to figure it out. I got some great mentors and I was able to start making a ton more money. And I couldn't go back to working for a company. I mean, if they paid me a hundred million a year, sure. I guess I, I twist my arm, <laughs> I'll do it. But I mean, I mean, for the type of salaries that that these folks pay these days, there's just no way I do it. I mean, come on. I like being in charge of my own destiny way, way too much. I like making my own rules. You, you mm. know what I mean? And I, yeah. I, I, I'm wondering, I mean, that, that, that probably applies to you, right? There was a values misalignment and you're like, nope, mm-hmm. I'm going to set up my own deal. I'm going to have my own values reign supreme, right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. And I think that, that's it. We, 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 as entrepreneurs, we do have a certain, um, we're mostly control freaks, let's be honest. I mean, yes, if, if honest. people listening in, we, we are, we're control freaks. And so we like to have things done our way. And so for me, it was about, okay, I want to get my own business where I can actually have a say in the way that things are done. And I haven't got to report into a board and I haven't got to be told what to do by sort of yeah, people above me, but I can actually just do what I want to do. Um, and that, you know, I wouldn't say it went perfectly. I, I, I don't think I was particularly good in my first business. I thought I was, idealistically, I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't actually have, if I'm honest, the balls to do some of the stuff that I needed to do. I'm very much, if we talk in the US about the visionary and the integrator, and I, I didn't realize at the time, because I'd always been a DM, which is usually like an integrator role, the person who manages the business plan, the person who manages the people, the person is very much into details. But I realized in my own business, I didn't want to be that person because I don't actually really enjoy the tough conversations. I like the big picture thinking. I like, you know, where could we go to next? What could we do uh, with the business? And so uh, there was a real um, struggle internally about, you know, what role did I need to play? And and when I ran my event centre, so I had an event centre for a number of years just before COVID hit and that, that kind of closed it down. But um, I, I realised that I just, I'm not the person who should be involved in the day-to-day running of the business. In my own business, I actually play a different role to what I played when I was running other people's businesses. So again, you, you, cha- you change um, depending on the environment you're in, you change depending on where you're at in your stage in life. Tell me about EOS. Like, you know, I know what EOS is. I've heard of EOS. I I, I went and sat through a a presentation with a fellow I knew who was an EOS implementer, but most of the folks listening to this probably don't. They're probably curious. They're going, what the hell is EOS? So tell us, what is EOS? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a fair question, and, and uh, I think particularly where I'm from, this side of the world, nobody knows what EOS is. So I do a lot of time, spend a lot of time actually explaining, you know, what EOS is. So EOS stands for the Entrepreneurial Operating System, um, and it is really just a very simple framework, a pragmatic set of tools that can help you to put a little bit of structure into your business to help you to run it. And it's designed with entrepreneurs in mind because we know as entrepreneurs, you know, I, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur myself. We're distracted by bright shiny lights, and we want to do this over here. We've got these crazy ideas. And so we can actually do damage to our own business because of that, because we come in and we go, oh, I've got this fantastic idea. I'll give a really silly example. I might come in one, one Monday morning to my meeting and go, hey, I know that we do coaching and I know that we do EOS, but what if we actually made, because we've got these stuffed elephants we use in our, in, our, um, in our session rooms, what if we started making stuffed elephants? And they go, what do you mean? It's well, I think there's a real market for these stuffed elephants. And so then you go away and you come back next Monday and suddenly all your team are you know, there with trunks and, and eyes and stuff stuffing you go what are you doing and they said we're building elephants why are you building elephants because you told us we should be building elephants Deborah it's like no 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 I was just thinking out loud about some crazy idea I had in the week and I've moved past that now and so as as, as visionaries we tend to do that and that can be really disruptive for the business because we're coming in there and we're just talking out loud about our ideas people take them as gospel and so they start working on them and they sort of um they they they, you know they then told them no we're not doing that anymore so EOS gives you a framework to go hey let's make sure that we are really clear around what the roles and functions are in the business, who's accountable for those roles and functions. Let's make sure that the visionary, which we absolutely need in this business, has a set kind of um, set of accountabilities that they actually work within. And then you've got an integrator who's there to kind of hold the whole thing together. And then we've got our team. And it just, and then it gives you things like, you know, scorecards and, and measurables and processes and just a little bit of structure so that we don't get that that danger of the entrepreneur going off on many, many tangents. Yeah, you know, there was a book that was written many years ago called The E-Myth, um, yes. you know, by Michael Gerber. Michael and Gerber, yeah. Yeah, and then he wrote The E-Myth Revisited. And all these things you're talking about, to me, just kind of remind me of, of that book and the lessons yeah. from that book, which is we entrepreneurs, yeah, I absolutely suffer from, you know, shiny penny syndrome. Oh, my God, <laughs> we need to stop <laughs> selling coaching and we need to start making knives. There's a huge market for coaching. <laughs> 
yeah. you know, um, that's, and, and that's crazy. And then I get stuck into, well, I'm really good at sales. So I'm going to do all the sales. I'm going to do all the sales. Then mind all the other stuff. Then am I thinking about the business to grow yet? I'm good at sales. Let me do the sales. That doesn't grow a business. That gets yeah. you all messed up. So what EOS does essentially is it teaches you how to be a proper grown-up adult business owner rather than this, yeah. you, you know, teenage person who just wants what they want when they want it and the hell with anything else, basically, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly right. And like I said, it's designed to give you some frameworks and some structure without taking away that entrepreneurial spirit, which we absolutely need. And so you're right, the EMA 3 visit, one of my favorite books. Um, the, the work that Gino did in putting together EOS, it comes from the EMA 3 visit and it comes from the scaling up stuff by Vern Heinrich. It comes from you know Patrick Lencioni's work around a healthy team. And so yeah. we do a lot of stuff around healthy team. Um, so we have three things we focus on. Vision, which is about getting every 100% on the same page. Traction, which is about discipline and accountability. And and that comes from the things like the Rockefeller Habits um, and Good to Great by Jim Collins. And so that's the, the structure that, you know, make sure you do have discipline and accountability to actually achieve that vision. And then finally, Healthy, which is the healthy team, which is the Patrick Lencioni work around, you know, how do you make sure your team is actually healthy? So I, I actually, I came across it again by accident. They launched into New Zealand using my events centre. And as I was a member of EO, the Entrepreneurs Organisation at the time, I went, EOS, that must be something around the same thing. And yeah. I couldn't make their actual event but I thought I must go and have I must read the books and I read the two books traction and get a grip and I went this is just perfect because it's everything I've naturally done throughout my life without realizing it it's partly what I learned in my MBA it's partly what I've learned through running businesses but it's all in this really beautiful simple format and at that point I said to them I, I, I'm interested and they said well we only take on board EOS implementers who've run a business, who have got an entrepreneurial background themselves. Um, so you're perfect. Let's come and join us. And that's when I got involved three years that's ago. Awesome. <laughs> mm. That's awesome. I love it. I love it. I love it. So um, who is EOS for and who is it not for? Yeah, it's interesting. I, mean, I actually think EOS is for any business, but even in uh, the 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 structure and the, uh, having some yeah having a lot of foundation of EOS is actually good for any business so even as a startup just thinking about you know what is your long term vision um, do you have a two page business plan do you have your scorecard your measurables do you have the right structure do you have the right people all those things if you put them in, in place in the beginning it's great so it definitely works for any size business as an implementer I generally tend to with much larger businesses so it's you know somebody who's got maybe ten to two hundred and fifty staff they're established probably you know I've been around for most of my clients that I work with have been going for twenty five thirty years. So they're not startups. They've been around for a long time. They've generally got somewhere between 50 and a couple of hundred staff. Um, and they've got a good business. But what they don't have is a great business. And when I say great, I mean, as an owner, they're probably working a lot more hours than they think they should be working. They're probably not getting the profit they really think they should be getting. They probably <laughs> feel like they have a lack of control when in actual fact, sometimes it's quite the opposite. They're too controlling. So it's like they, but they feel like they've got this lack of control. Um, there's a whole, you know, they, they think they've got people issues. They're, they're struggling with their people. And so, that's, that's the, the best work I can do is working with those size businesses to go, hey, let's see how we can um, help solve some of those issues. Yeah, I think that's absolutely fantastic. You know, mm -hmm. um, to me, yeah, the principles that you're talking about obviously apply to any business. But, yep. you know, it, it's a little bit like thought leadership. Thought leadership can apply to any type of business. Can apply, But it applies best to experts, to authorities, to <laughs> consultants, to coaches. Can a CEO do it? Yeah, I actually have a CEO who's uh, hired me one-on-one -on -one to help him become a thought leader, okay? He wants yep. to have his own brand, his own podcast, and eventually get his own book out there. He wants to use that to help grow all his brands. He wants to be like the Elon Musk of his space. But my the person I'm able to help the best is someone like you. You know what yep. I mean? Someone like uh, Lori, who, who you met a little while ago. Those types of folks, you type of folks, you're the folks yep. who you'll take to this like a duck to water. And the same with what you're doing in EOS. It can help any business. But if a business has been around for a while, it's been mature, it's got a certain yep. size and a heft to it, it just works better. It, it, it yep. delivers better results, right? Faster. Well, 
Yeah, and they, they generally tend to feel like they've hit the ceiling and we talk about how we can actually help them break through that. I also personally love working with family businesses. Um, and this is because I think it's because of my love of people, but I, I love the family dynamics. It adds a, an extra dynamic to the business. Um, it can be tough. You know, we have to have some really tough conversations when we work with family businesses, but they're conversations they've sometimes never had before. And I love the fact that I'm actually able to facilitate that and help them have those difficult conversations, but for the greater good. And so, you know, often family businesses is, you know, you've got people working in their business because they're a family, not necessarily the right person, the right seat. And so that's like, how do we actually make sure everybody's doing what they love with people they love and, you know, living the life they want to? Yeah, that sounds pretty cool. The family businesses have some of their own unique dynamics, right? I mean, because of the family relationships are intertwined in the business relationships, sometimes that can bring an extra emotional component to it that, you know, isn't necessarily present in non-family businesses, right? Yeah. That's one of the Absolutely. big issues they have to deal with, right? It could be like a big pain point for them at some points. Mm. And if you think about it, it's not just about the sort of people, but there's often a lot of stuff that's gone on outside of the business. So we, when we talk about family business, we've got this kind of the three circles of family business. So you've got the people who actually work in the business. You've got kind of the owners of the business who may or may not have a role in the business. Um, and then you've got the actual family itself, as in the, the family component. So often large families um, and some will be working in the business some won't be. Some will be owning, owning the business, some people don't. And they've got the family trust. And it's just interesting to kind of you know, take a step back and be really, really clear about which circle you're working within and then what you need to be doing within that particular circle but also thinking about if you think about families they've often got history as a family way before the business ever came into play and so sometimes there's some, some work to do around making sure that, that stuff is dealt with before you can move forward with a business and I'll never forget working with one family business beautiful family business I love them to pieces but uh, it was a mum and a dad and a brother and a sister and there was a third um sibling that wasn't in the business and when we first started talking about you know what, what their vision was and where they were headed we suddenly uncovered all of this deep-seated issues around uh, resentment around you know the different roles people play in the business the amount of money mum my dad lent to one sibling and not to another. And I've realized that without getting this stuff out, we could never move forward. And so we had to do a little bit of a deep dive into what had gone on in the past in order to move forward into the future. That makes so much sense. You know, it mm. just makes so, so much sense. Um, I, I got to say, you know, that uh, what you do really is all about helping entrepreneurs scale, right? I was talking to um, a guest for the podcast uh, on an interview actually yesterday. And one of the things he, he kind of said to me, he said, marketing really as, a, as an expert, as a thought leader is simple. It's that simple. You've got to be focused on making people a big, bold promise, one that they really want. If you make that kind of promise to people, then you're in good shape. So I said, okay, let, let's let's think about like for me, I thought, thought to myself, okay, I like this. What kind of promise should I be making to people? He says, well, what do most people come and see you for? Right. I was learning from this guy. You know what I mean? I teach this mm -hmm. stuff to people, but you know, you get an expert on, 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 on your podcast. You want to like see what they can teach you too. Right. That's my little yep. secret. Hey, I bring in coaches. They teach me something. So I learned something about EOS from you today. It's, it's great. So he said, well, what do most people want? And I, I said, well, most people come to me because they want to make more money, right? Their business isn't where they want it to be. He said, what if you told all your you know, prospective thought leader clients that your promise is you're going to help them add a zero to their annual profit or income? Mm -hmm. I'm like, yeah, that's a good promise. I like that promise. I like that promise a lot. He said, okay, steal it. I'm like, okay, done. <laughs> so what's my promise? I help you add a zero to your income. Help you add a zero to your profits. That gets everybody's attention. All right. You got me. How do we do this? Right. That's that's <laughs> what you want to do. And and for yeah. you, you're talking to people who own businesses that are good businesses, but they're not great businesses. They're probably working them too hard. They're, they, yeah. they're doing well, but they could be doing even better. So your promise to them is I'm going to help you work less in your business and I'm going to help you make more, make more money than you ever thought of. Both of those at the same time. Now, for a lot yeah. of people. That's like a fantasy. They'd love that, but they don't think it's possible, right? But if you make yeah. that kind of promise to them, they're like, okay, you've got my attention, Deborah. How do we do this? <laughs> Absolutely. And I talk about living your ideal life because I think that, you know, I, I don't think we talk about work life balance. I was just talking about this with a, a previous podcast um, as well. It's like, 
it's different for everybody. You know, I love my work and I know that working 55 to 60 hours a week is absolutely perfect for me. That's my optimal amount of time that I love spending working in the business. Anything more than that, I get tired. I'm not kind of, you know, not on my A game. Anything less than that, and I actually, I, I get bored and twiddling my thumbs. And so yeah, for me, that's my, I, yeah, that's my ideal thing. And that's, you know, people look at that and go, but I only want to work 20 or 30 hours. Great. I'm not saying that what I do is right. I'm saying it's right for me. And so part of understanding, you know, working less hours and making more money, like what is your optimal amount of time you want to spend in the business? What is the optimal amount of money? And anything is possible if you're really clear on what you want. And my, my promise is always around, you know, I want people to be doing what they love with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately for what they do, but having time to pursue other passions. And that's the thing that I had to learn in my business, my first couple of businesses. I was probably doing what I love with people that love. I was making a difference, so certainly being compensated appropriately, but I had zero time for anything else. It was, it was, it was consuming my entire life. And I have other things I like to do. I like photography. I like cycling. I like spending time with my husband. You know, And so it's like getting clear on what's important to you and then designing your business around your life and i'm not talking about indiv- i'm talking about businesses that have got you know as i say 50 to a couple of hundred staff you still need to design that business as the owner to, to fit in with what you want out of life and that's what we we do i love it i love it i love it i think that's super califragilistic fantastic you know <laughs> deborah you're like an entrepreneur's entrepreneur you're somebody who um you're an entrepreneur yourself and you yep. know what issues entrepreneurs are facing and you know how to help them solve those problems. I think it's really fantastic. I'm really grateful that you decided to come on the show with me today and to share some of your <laughs> wisdom with people. So um, if someone wants to get a hold of you, find out about what you do, find out about EOS, what's the best way? Yeah, I was, probably the easiest thing, just because I've got a very complex surname and it's very hard to spell. If you just go to Deborah, dot, which is D-E-B-R-A, dot coach, that is my uh, main site that will give you access to all the different things that I do. So it's got the it's got the EOS stuff on there. It's got the podcast that I do. It's got the resources that I share with people. You should better find everything on there. Although it is going through a wee bit of a revamp, but hopefully um, it should be up and running in the next couple of days. <laughs> oh, absolutely great. Deborah.coach. That's very clever. Good job on getting that, that domain name. Very, very Thank impressive. You. Yeah. I like I've that. Actually, I actually have it on my, I got a, um, I'm about to get a new car. Um, I have not had a new car in many, many years. I'm about to get a new car. So I got myself a new number plate and it actually has live your ideal entrepreneurial life, Deborah.coach. And then it's got EOSI in the middle, which is what I am. I'm an EOS implementer. You're so fabulous. Oh my goodness. That's awesome. Okay. We're going to make sure that's put into the show notes. So we end off okay. each show by asking you, our guest mm-hmm. expert, what are your top three expert action steps? These are your three best pieces of advice for yeah. my listener to take to take their life, their business to the next level. What say you? So I, I think the first thing is is really about being very, very clear about what you actually want. And I, I'm not sure, some people have, can just do this naturally. They go, yes, I know what I want from life. I know what I want from business. Other people need some help with that. So do whatever works for you. Either take yourself away to a nice quiet place and think about what is important, ask yourself some difficult questions, or get somebody to actually ask those questions of you. So you need to be thinking very much about what is your ideal life? How much time do you want to spend working? What kind of role do you want in the business? Because without that, it's difficult difficult to actually move to the next stage, which is then getting very, very clear um, on your vision and where you're headed. And so I recommend using one of our tools, which is the VTO, the Vision Traction Organizer, which there is a two-page plan that just goes, hey, where are we headed in the long term? Who are we? Why do we exist? What are we trying to do? Um, and having that clearly articulated in a way that you can then share with everybody in your business and in your life just helps to keep you on track the whole time. And the third thing is, I mean, it's, it's one of my, um, it's one of the things I've always struggled with. It's like ask for help uh, because we don't have to do this alone. And there are many, many people out there who will help you. And I think I always thought that asking for help was a sign of failure. It meant I didn't know my stuff. It meant I didn't know what, you know, um, how to do things. But I've had, I've had to reposition that for myself and I, and I teach other people too. So you, when you, you know, when you help somebody, how does it make you feel? And you go, wow, it makes me feel amazing, yeah? <laughs> um, so if you don't ask for help, you're basically ripping those people off by not allowing them to have that same feeling. So why don't you just go and make somebody's day and ask them for some help, make them feel good, and you'll get some great value out of it 
you know, I love all three of your expert action steps. I think they're all fantastic, but your last one is the best of them all. Um, honestly, people in our industry quite often, because, you know, we're coaches, we're consultants, we're, we're experts at what we do. We don't want to go out and, um, and ask for help, right? We think we should be able to figure it out, but you could save so much time by getting help from other people, by being part of a great community uh, and, and having peers mentor you and by having some great mentors, like that could take like years, decades off of your journey to success. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I got this thing, I go hashtag don't do it alone. Hashtag don't do 2022 alone. And every year it will be next year. It'll be hashtag don't do 2023 alone. Like, I yep. believe in that very strongly. Uh, I, I happen to be blessed to have a great couple of mentors in my life right now, in my business. I got a great health and fitness mentor. I got a great relationship mentor. I got a couple of great business mentors that I work with. And that's mm -hmm. what I offer for people. I offer for people a space where they don't have to be alone because being alone is yeah. terrible. The chattering monkeys in your head will get in the way. Yeah. So they'll you know, destroy you. Yeah. They will destroy you. This conversation is great because like you've had a busy day. I've had a busy day, but I know that like you're a high energy person. You're awesome. You got, you're smart. You have good things to say. So I'm looking forward to this because I knew that during the time we would spend together, I'd be energized and it would send me off into <laughs> what I have to do next you know, feeling really good and really powerful. And that is a powerful lesson for us all to take on. You, you got to not do it alone. You got to be careful that you pick the right people to hang around with people you like, people you respect, people that are going to really make you feel like, you know, you're living life uh, the, the way you, you were meant to live life. So bravo, Deborah. Well done. Absolutely. Well done. Well done. Well done. <laughs> so listener, Deborah Chantry Taylor is the real deal. If you're curious about EOS, you want to find out about EOS, definitely go to her, her website, Deborah.coach. We're going to put all that in the show notes and reach out to her. She's amazing. She's, you know, uh, very approachable and she'll definitely be of service to you. And listener, here's another thing. If you enjoyed the episode and you got a friend in your life, somebody who's maybe not doing so great these last few weeks, months, last couple of years, maybe, maybe they need to hear some encouraging voices in their life. Share this episode with them. The, the, the beautiful energy and positivity that Deborah brings could be the thing that'll lift them out of their, their doldrums. You never know where people are at. You never know where something as simple as sharing a really great episode that you heard could completely change the trajectory of somebody's life. So make sure that you do that. Deborah, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's an honor to have you here. Well, my absolute pleasure. I always walk away from our conversations feeling completely energized myself as well. So thank you. My pleasure. My pleasure. And that wraps up another exciting episode of the podcast, The Thought Leader Revolution. To find out more about today's incredible guest, the one and only Deborah Chantry Taylor, go to thethoughtleaderrevolution.com. Check out the show notes or wherever you happen to listen to this episode. And please, please, please share this with someone who needs to hear the message. Until next time, goodbye. This episode has been brought to you by eCircleAcademy.com, the proven system to add six to seven figures a year to your thought leader practice.